Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 80 of Tone Talk with Dave Friedman and Mark Uzanski. We've got an awesome guest today, Rusty Anderson. Rusty, how are you? Hello. What's going on? Oh, I'm good. How are you? Good. Good to have you on. Dave, how are you? I'm fine. Just uh, I'm uh, uh, sitting in, a, obviously, a new location for me. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, the sun is shining out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's, it's like lit up from the side, you know. <laughs> you get a little sunburn. I, don't think I like that side of his face, Mark. Please. Yeah, well, if you could see it, it's kind of really glaring. <laughs> we can't win. I can't win if I close the curtains here. It's already it's a nice, dark. I like it. It's too like, dark, and if not, nah, whatever. It's fine. Yeah, it's great. Perfect. I can well, never win with the lighting. I like the red velvet that you got there. Oh, and the cool lamps up top. Yeah, I think it works good with the laptop here with just like be able to focus because it focuses up and you see the cool lamps. Yeah. <laughs> Looks good. Looks good. Rusty Rusty was here yesterday. yesterday. What's that? Rusty was here yesterday. Oh, you live by yeah, close by? True. I I I confess I was there yesterday. You confess yeah. we were doing a little tweak on his pedal board. That's right. Which rig is this? Board. Is this for Paul McCartney? Um, this is a multi-use. I've used it with Paul. Yeah. I use it for my own thing. It's kind of my smallest little one that I, it's always easier to use a small pedal board because they can get unruly as we know. As you well know. Yeah. <laughs> as we well know for years. They can, they can. So you, you and Dave, we, cause you and I were talking about it, Rusty off, offline that you and Dave go way back. Yes, we go way back. Yeah. What was it? Uh, Dave was working at Andy Brower, right? Yeah, I think yeah, I think the first time I met you as you rolled through with some sort of little rack of some sort. Uh, oh, green rack. Green rack, yeah. Yeah, the little green rack, and uh, yeah, and you hooked me up, and that was like you know, beginning of a beautiful relationship. Yeah, we had we've had a long, long, long relationship. Eighties. Had to be around 88, maybe even. Yeah, late 80s, probably. Yeah. Whatever. So who are you playing for then? Um, let's see. Maybe, I know I did a Bangles record. That was kind of like that that big Bangles record with uh, Manic Monday and Walk Like an Egyptian and all that stuff I, I played on. And that was kind of like the first record, you know, of another artist that I played on that was like, you know, got huge radio airplay and stuff. So that was fun. Um, and uh, then I started sort of playing on different people's records as I was doing my own groups and, you know, kind of wearing a lot of hats like musicians tend to do, you know? Right. Right. Well, that's interesting. I always, for some reason, I thought that they all played their own instruments on the album. Did they, uh, or. <laughs> <laughs> no. What, 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 one day we'll have Josh Freeze on and we'll ask him how many albums that he played on that no one knows. <laughs> That's right. No, it's, I mean, it's actually the credits are on the record too, so it's not. Okay. They're not uh, for secret, but, <laughs> so it's not really a secret. It's just, well, that's cool. That's great. Yeah, there was some good guitar parts on there. So, well, so how, did, how did, you know, I, I don't really even know the full story. I mean, I met you then, right? And you were already starting to play with the Bangles and this and that. And um, where did it all start? Where did you where did you grow grow up originally? And how did it, how did you get into all this mess? Uh, well, the messiness started. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I got my first. Uh, uh, my dad gave me a pawn shop guitar and amp, little Kent. Yeah, amp Kent guitar. They went together perfectly. And um, and I was just thrilled beyond belief to actually hold it on my hands because I'd wanted one since I was five, you know. Sort of, the, I think the Beatles were the first group that I sort of clocked it like that's cool. I want to do that, you know. Then I got into Jimi Hendrix and and Led Zeppelin and Cream and all that stuff. But um, uh, so I just uh, you know if if uh, if there was people hanging out at school or whatever, like yeah, you want to be my friend here? Play this guitar, play a bass, play drums, you know. And so we'd, we'd uh, I'd always force people to be in bands with me and stuff. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and it just kind of went from there, really. And that was in La Habra, California, which is sort of a uh, no man's land area. It's sort of the Southern California, 
you know, 20 miles from the beach, inland from the beach, and it was uh, um, not close to any freeways, you know, that kind of place. Inland and isolated. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And there was, uh, uh, you know, the heights were nice. That was kind of cool to be able to ride your bike around through there. But um, uh, Hollywood wasn't too, too far away, you know, calling right. out the name. You know, to come play at uh, the Whiskey and Gazaris and all those kinds of places. So, right. So when did that start happening? Well, let's see. We, we, yeah, I was probably 14 or 15, 15 maybe, playing those places. And and then we started doing, uh, we hooked up with a radio station, started doing a bunch of free concerts at high schools. And then um, we played we played the, I remember we playing a place called the Golden West Ballroom, which I think turned into a church eventually. I don't know what it is now, but in Norwalk. And, uh, and we're like, okay, cool. So we go down there and we were the opening act and the headlining act was Van Halen and they weren't signed yet. And, um, that was a trip. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's interesting cause we watched them sound check and they were doing all cover tunes mostly. And they were just standing there being completely, you know, sort of innocuous and, and, uh, and I thought, oh, wow, yeah, they're, they're good. You know, and Eddie was playing more sort of like, sort of straight up kind of, you know, good rock guitar, like uh, Joe Walsh or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. his song, I think. And, uh, and so then when, and then they, I remember they, they, uh, Oh, oh, what happened was then I was playing a double neck guitar that I had custom made. It was kind of this horrible guitar, but it was my first venture into having a custom. It was a, a BC rich double neck, right? Mm. Oh boy. And yeah. <laughs> so you can imagine it was a cruel guitar too, because it had a little point at the top. <laughs> so when you played it, it just kind of stabbed you. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, but uh, I had it in this case, it's this, uh, this flight case and, and after the sound check, I had it out. Eddie came up. He's like, wow, look at that. And he was all tripping out on it. You know, like, that's interesting. So, uh, and he was very nice. And then uh, I remember we did our set. And then before they went on, they had all their, they had um, brown, like, jumpsuits, like, really, uh, like, janitors. And they went and set up all their gear. And then they put their flash clothes on and then came played the set. And they were, like, super you know, flamboyant and everything, but, you know, in that sort of earthy way, you know, kind of, yeah. yeah, yeah, but yeah, they were, they were definitely a force to be reckoned with. And that was uh, my first exposure to them. And then we ended up playing a lot of shows with them in over a few years. And what band was this with, that you were in at the time? The band that I was in was called Eulogy and it was a really good band. Actually. It was sort of a, uh, sort of like, Prog, all of Genesis or something meets, you know, theatrical David Bowie, Alice Cooper kind of thing. Uh -huh. uh, and sort of, it was sort of like punk, prog, uh, pop kind of band or something. Pretty, you know, hard rocking kind of thing, but right. you know, ballads and stuff. But it was never, it was not so much like a sappy kind of thing. It was more kind of arty. Yeah. And, um, but that band, that band, we, we had a lot. We actually played for Clive Davis twice. We had a lot of notoriety, but I think the personalities were too explosive. And the band, after like five years or so, blew up, which is a long time to keep a band together anyway. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you're teenagers and everything's insane anyway. But uh, yeah, but then over, the, and then we ended up playing with a lot of police uh, song. Um, I was going to say, we played with the police. We played with, uh, I don't know, a bunch of random bands, uh, OMD. Alvin Lee, you know, all sorts of, you know, random bands opening up for them at various places around Los Angeles. And um, uh, it, it was it was a very interesting time, you know, it was a great way to cut your teeth on the whole scene and meet some people. And Yeah, it was a moment in time that was that was amazing. I mean, like, really, what was going on, you know, <laughs> with what is this late seventies into into the early eighties, right? You know, yeah. Well, it, it also if if you look back, it was quite a scene. You know, like there was that early sixties. I mean, that late sixties scene on the strip mm -hmm. you know, that they've made these these um, docs about or movies about or whatever. Um, you know, with the with the doors and uh, 
maybe I don't know the birds or whoever that you know love and um, moments in the pop is music machine. Yeah. You know that kind of, that era of music, mm -hmm. and then this was sort of like the one after that. You know, right? It was, it was you know who do we play with? Um, there was boys, which George Lynch was in the boys, Exciter, or whatever they're called, um, and uh, there was Quiet Riot. It was especially played. We played at the Starwood a lot, and that was an amazing club. You know, and and. I guess we played with Van Halen probably four times. We played with them at Golden West Ballroom. We played with them at Myron's Ballroom, which is this weird boxing uh, in place down in, uh, in downtown. We played with them at the Pasadena Civic when it was like, I think it was right after they they just got signed or something. It was a show at Pasadena Civic. And then, and then right before they're going on tour at a place called the Cars of the Stars, which was in... Um, Orange County, yeah, like Anaheim or something. And, um, and in fact, one of those gigs, I think it was Myron's, we headlined over him. And we had this kind of flash, like mirrored, weird thing that we that we, we sort of used. And I, and I remember, that I think they were a bit ticked off, you know, because it was like, I think there was a lot of sort of Competition between all the bands, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's like trying to be the headliner, trying to get the good gigs or whatever. And then there was also, I think, a lot of appreciation, you know, just for the talent out there. And and it was sort of a weird little scene, but I guess no one really totally knew it at the time. You know, it just everyone's just trying to get to the next step, the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. It was yeah, in those days, I mean, I wasn't here in those days. I was in Detroit, but it's the same thing. It was like the bands weren't necessarily friendly. It was a competition on who was climbing the ladder, you know, and who yeah, was yeah. getting the better gigs and who was headlining and, and you know, and who was packing them in. And it's a whole different era. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, especially with COVID, you know, no one's playing gigs at all, really. Pretty much. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> So were, were you uh, friends with Ed, you know, in the band over yeah, the years? I was. I'd call him up once in a while. Hey, I need to get some uh, some tuning pegs for my Firebird. Where should I go? Or, you know, whatever. And, you know, and he was moderately friendly. I think, I, I mean, he, I, I definitely like, sort of respected him or really sort of, uh, I don't know. But he was, he was like, he, he, the, the weird thing about him was that he he had this sort of level that he was at. All of a sudden, it just exploded, sort of, you know? Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, he just kind of, over the course of maybe a year or so, he completely transformed. Because he was, like, playing, when I, he was playing at 335 when I first saw him. And then he, when he got into the Strat Wangbar thing, sort of everything changed. And he sort of started going nuts with that and <laughs> and that. And I remember because uh, I was really into Steve Hackett from Genesis, and I, and and I used to do a lot of sort of tapping things that like sort of in in the vein that he was doing, and um, and Ed never did that, and all of a sudden like he started doing that, and I always wondered if he had because he would come see the band, he liked their band a lot, he liked their songs and stuff, and uh, I, I remember we we're playing at the Whiskey, and. Uh, or no, it was it was Gazzari's. and he and he came up uh, between sets, and he's like, uh, "Hey man, can you buy me a drink?" You know, he, he was uh, he was very much into like sort of the scene and the partying and the you know drinking and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting, you know, party scene. You know, right, right, yeah, right. right. <laughs> I mean, back then, because there was a lot of, I guess drugs are still sort of ubiquitous, but I think it was a, it was kind of pretty, pretty heavy drug scene in the 70s, I think. It might. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, uh, yeah I can imagine, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy time. That's awesome. So, and did you guys ever record from your band? Or were you guys, did you ever we, make an we did album? record? We did record some stuff. We have the, the best recordings we did were sort of 16 track at some studio in uh, Orange County. And uh, and they came out pretty good, but it was all pretty quick. We never quite got to the point of like, we really should have just 
we should have just uh, recorded all and documented. But you don't, you don't, when you're doing it, you're not always aware of the day to day future of what's, you know, your time frame or what is important always. You, you're just guessing. So, you know, and then at that time, you're holding out for the big, you know, record deal in the sky instead of like going, hey, well, let's make our own independent record and work our way up. You know, you didn't really think that way yet. That became more of a prevalent thing in the 80s, really. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. true. It's very true. So then what was the next step from there? Um, then um, I, I started, work, you know, putting together a new band after that band broke up. Um, and uh, and that took a, a second. Um, but so eventually the Living Daylights was formed. In the meantime, I was teaching guitar and, you know, that was my main gig. And... Uh, and that was a really great band. We we uh, we got we played a lot of gigs, um, got a lot of fans, and um, and but again, I think the personalities were too crazy. Of course, I had nothing to do with it because you know. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm perfect. laughs> right, of course. Of course. But no, I'll, you know, it, it's 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 tough, you know, when you're dealing with there's so many factors involved. You know, one of them's money. I think if you got too much money or not enough money, you know, it can, everything back in that department can screw you up. And, and just, you know, what 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 are people doing with their lives? You know, I, I was insane enough to think it was a good idea to be a musician, you know, because it looks so good on paper. But uh, well, I think I think you know, for you and that for that time, you know, just think how bad it looks on paper now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. like in this day and age, you know, you're, oh, God. Yeah. No, I know. It's, it's, yeah. it's At least you had the opportunity to have record deals and to do things and to plan, you know, when they were making music and records and things, you know. And well, so. it really was. I mean, you, that's one thing I think we're all realizing is you come out and you see the trajectory of music. I mean, recorded music started maybe 100 years ago, like the first mm -hmm. wax cylinder thing or whatever it was. And, um, you know, and now it's kind of, you know, sort of fell off a cliff when the digital thing happened. And now it's fall off the, the second or third cliff. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there was some I, I heard uh, Bob Dylan was getting interviewed and, and the interviewer says, well, hey, I wonder if you have any advice for some uh, young, young people trying to break into the music business. And he goes, break into the music business. That's like breaking into the bank after it's already been robbed. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds pretty accurate. That's funny. <laughs> hey, by the way, we um, we have a super chat from Robert Bogdan. Thanks. He says, tell Rusty I love his signature 335. Great guitar. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that was a treat doing that with Gibson. Because we. it's funny thing on that. We were um, I, with Paul McCartney. I was doing, you know, uh, Tour after tour after year after year, and now the COVID thing is kind of like this year we had to uh, we had to uh, cancel the postpone or whatever the tour, so uh, <laughs> gives you a lot of time to reflect. But um, we we were playing in Memphis, I remember, and and we were staying in this weird hotel, and right across the street was the Gibson factory. Uh, I don't know if it's still there or not because I know they've changed their their management things around a bit, but. Um, but they had their whole, you know, the whole factory and go, could go in and take a tour and look at like the machines they made to, they used to make the 335s where they had like their old, you know, from the forties or something. And they had these tin pans in the corners, um, like the, you, that you make pies out of or whatever. And, and they had oil in them because the oil dripped and they had to put oil in it. And it was, you know, they, it was all very archaic and, and beautiful and mm -hmm. super, super artsy, craftsy. But I got to meet with meet with uh, Mike Boltz, and he was an awesome guy to, to work with on that project. And uh, and I was telling him all the things I wanted to do with the Gibson. You know, I, I'm saying, man, you got to you got to get your bolts deeper into the wood, you know, for better resonance, like the old days. He goes, okay, we can do that. I'm like, and I want these kind of pickups, you know, with the mismatched and the bobbins and the da da da. He goes, okay, we can do that. And then I'm like. Um, Oh, and also this this truss rod thing. You put like this rubber sheath or something over the truss rod, and and that's dampening out the guitar and making it somewhere plasticky. You know, so, oh yeah, we can take that off. 
And it was a bunch of things like that, you know, that uh, that we worked on to make the guitar. And I said, you have to make it light, you know, and because some of the guitars just get too heavy, like my original um, uh, Blonde 59 335 that was patterned after is is very light. And some of the guitars are as light as that. Some of them are a little heavier. I mean, each batch of wood is different. So it's it's you can't keep them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. From guitar to guitar, they all just end up being a different weight, which is kind of the beauty and kind of the bummer. But um, but yeah, I, I, I've gotten a lot of good responses on the guitar, which is cool. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I was actually just looking looking it up um, to show people the guitar, um, which I think I have it right here, just to show an image of it real quickly, uh, if I can do it. Oh, it's beautiful. Is it up yet? <laughs> uh, no, it's not working. I don't know why it's not working. Why isn't it working for me? Um, oh, here we go. Okay. No, it's not working. Never mind. Uh, don't worry. I don't know. You know why. Normally, you can show an image on the screen, but apparently, it's not working today. You know why? I, I, I updated. I had to update the. Uh, the max the present time in the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever I did, I upgraded yeah. and it didn't work. So oh well. Um but that's great. That's a great guitar, I'm sure it is. Uh we had Randy Wilcox who also gave us a super chat. Uh just said, you know, thanks guys. Want to say Mark, we're birthday twins. Happy birthday, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um and happy music birthday, thank you, Rusty. I appreciate it. Is it today? Uh, it's today. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Doing a show on his birthday. Big, the big 52. Uh, happy birthday, Mark. Have a drink on me. Thanks, Music Therapy Laz. I appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah. So, anyway, getting back to you, Rusty. Um, so, yeah, that's a it's a great guitar. I don't know why I can't share the, whatever is going on. But, oh, so, yeah, yeah. Look it up. <laughs> yeah, okay. check it out. I think there's it's available on Sweetwater. Um and musicians friend if what i just saw so um so then how did how did things progress for you from there where you started playing with you know bigger artists and kind of being a session guy um i remember we we did some recordings uh at shangri-la studios which rick rubin now uh, possesses at the time it was uh you worked with rock Barboni mostly and he he was a an engineer that he'd done a bunch of stuff with like Bob Dylan and the band and um, Clapton or whoever. And um, so, yeah, we did some, some recording with him. And then I started working with some artists. He brought me in a few people that uh, weren't like, actually this one guy, Max Gronenthal, who ended up singing with, uh, what's this? Or something? I don't know. He was one of those super singer guys with this amazing voice, big Paul guy. And, uh, and he had a solo record. So, and then I, I guess the Bangles was the first one that I started, like that had a fair amount of notoriety. And then I started working with a bunch of groups, you know, just sort of from there, it turned into like Elton John, Sinead O'Connor, New Radicals, uh, you know, Ricky Martin. I did some stuff with God, Steve Tyler, you know, I don't know, a bunch of people. Wow. That's an interesting, interesting story. So this would, this would then be early, early nineties, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you were doing I, special. I remember, actually, you know, there's been so many different people that I've worked with in different different capacities. Whether well, it's, you know, I remember you telling me a story. You did a the Ricky Martin thing. You did a demo. Living La Vida Loca. All right. right. You yeah. did. You did a demo. Yeah. He. Uh, well, what it was, this guy Rob. I uh, mean, uh, uh, Rob Rosa, who I'd been working with. He's a solo artist. And he he was good friends with Ricky Martin and had been working with him, writing with him and stuff. So he goes, hey, can you play in this record? I'm like, or in this demo. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. So he goes, yeah, we want to do it at your house. I'm like, okay. So I had the studio at my house and it was an, actually an ADAT studio at the time. And um, so, and I remember I couldn't quite, it was sort of in a transitional period. I didn't really have my guitar scene very dialed in. I sort of had this... Uh, you know, direct stuff I was using, some preamps and stuff. And and so 
and I couldn't get quite the right reverb because he just goes, hey, I just need some guitar stuff here. And it was completely nondescript. So I'm like, okay. So I, I, I just came up with all the parts and, um, and then laid it down. I didn't really have, I wanted a reverb on it, but I didn't have the right one really that I, I liked. So I thought, well, I'll just, they'll just put it on in the, uh, in the mix. It'll, you know, it'll be fine when they mix the demo. So, um, and I, I guess then that turned into, oh, oh no, the demo actually is going to be on the record. And it was like, oh, that's going to be the first song on the record. Oh, it's going to be the single. Oh, <laughs> the single's doing well. Oh, the single's blowing up gigantically. And and then I remember like being like at the gym or something, you know, or uh, you know, uh, supermarket, wherever I was, and um, and I hear the song and the you know coming through the speakers. I'm like, wow. And I'm like, oh man, there's no reverb at all on that guitar. It's completely bone dry. And it just it took me a long time to get used to that because I. That wasn't the idea, but I guess someone said, oh, I love the fact that it was bone dry. So, you know, it's, it's just <laughs> funny how it's, it almost seems like a lot of times in life, things are sort of a, a series of, of happenstances or mistakes or, you know, left uh, accidental left turns or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. That worked out thankfully for the best. Yeah. That was a massive song. Jesus. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. And then I, I was in a band called Animal Logic around that time in the '90s, and um, forgot about that one. Yeah, yeah. Stuart Copeland played drums. Stanley Clark played guitar or bass, and um, and it was a, it was a just a amazing, musically amazing band, and and a real trip to play with those guys. Really fun, and uh, and then recently, because I've been doing my own music right for a while. And uh, I have like maybe four records out or something. And um, so I'm working on some new music and I have this one song and I thought, God, be, I totally hear Stuart playing on it. So I asked him cause you know, we hang out and get together once in a while and uh, ride bikes or whatever. And, and he, uh, he goes, sure, yeah. And so he put some drums on it and, and it sounds amazing. Mm. Um, and so that's coming out soon. I'm sort of uh, figuring out like sort of how many songs I'm gonna put on a Deal. I might just put it a couple, or I might put out like all albums worth. I'm not sure yet. So, yeah, it's, um, a whole, a whole, it's a different world how you release music these days, right? It, is, it really is different. Yeah. So, yeah, just kind of getting that all together. I've, I've just got the mastering mostly done. So it's, it's something you, to soon. You, you also, though, had a, a signed band, Edna Swap. Yes. In yeah. And uh, yeah, we had about or records out, you know, on major labels and, and toured all over the place. And, um, and, and the song torn came out of that, which was one of the songs we got signed on. And I, I, uh, I remember we did the demo for that and I, I come with, up with the whole thing, like the, you know, the, the slide part and all that. And, um, and then I remember we, and then we put it out, but we didn't have the hit with it. Then someone else, uh, Natalie and Bruglia did it, and then just she karaoke the record that we did. Yeah, and it came out just like that, pretty much verbatim. And uh, <clears throat> um, that song got probably at least as huge as uh, the Loca. It's a pretty big one. Yeah. Well, at least you guys wrote it. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So that that's um, it's it's been an interesting series of winding roads for sure you know and then uh then actually through the studio that's how i met paul i, I uh um paul mccartney that is and then uh, a friend of mine a producer that i work with a lot david and uh uh he he says oh yeah i'm doing the new paul mccartney record and he goes i might need some guitar playing on it because we're friends and I, we talk all the time and i go great great i'm in so um a couple months later you know uh, I didn't really mention it to anyone because I didn't want to jinx it. So we got to the studio and then, uh, and then it was like two weeks of, of recording and uh, just like nonstop. It was really cool because like it was Abe and I, and, and um, it was just sort of this, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what we're doing. We come in and sing background vocals. Okay. Um, you do an overdub, you do an overdub, whatever, you know, we're just doing our thing but everyone's there the whole time, you know, instead of like coming in to do your guitar bits and then leaving, 
in their mm-hmm. backyard. It was like everyone just hang out. And that was really cool. You know, it was very, uh, you know, you really put you into the zone, the recording zone of the record. Um, yeah, it's like a band at that point. It's like, a, you yeah, know, you're, exactly. you're working with your own band or something. And then I remember he comes in one morning and it was really a trip because I had, I'd had dreams uh, when I was like six or seven years old about the Beatles being like my first super, you know, uh, big musical influence. And uh, they'd come to my front door and they'd ring the doorbell and they'd all be there in, the, in that picture that, like from the second Beatles record where, you know, Paul holding this bass and, you know, it's like the perfectly framed little thing. And they'd all be there just like that on my, on my doorstep saying, Hey, Rusty, you want to play? And we go, yeah, I go, yeah. <laughs> You know, so that's great. Uh, and it was a reoccurring dream. You know, it kept happening at least yeah. maybe three times. So then I remember Paul came in one morning. He goes, he goes, oh, hey, I had a dream about you last night, mate. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I thought, wow, that's a circular sort of <laughs> trippy moment, you know. I can imagine. So when, when you were going to, did you have to audition for the part or was it? Uh, or did you pretty much? No, it yeah. does. I think in, in his world, it doesn't really work that way. You know, mm. it's more like, um, uh, like I said, we came in through the producer, right? Did and then, um, and I guess uh, Brian came in. So I knew Brian. Abe knew him much better because he was touring together, and Brian came in through Abe, and um, and then Wix had already played with him. He, Wix actually started playing with him uh, in the in the nineties. So, so it was a hu- yeah. huge, yeah, as it was a huge as technically the, like the most hours logged, you know, but it's right. been two decades now playing with Paul. So it's, it's outlasted like every, every band I've been in, it's outlasted the Beatles. It's outlasted, you know, right. Pretty cool. That's amazing. It really is. So were you, how, how was your, how were your emotions, you know, going into it? You know that day, and you you know you know you're gonna be playing with the band, and were you like so? Were you scared? Were you you know just so excited? I'm just curious. I was excited. I remember I met Keith first, and he had an English accent. I thought, okay, I'm in the right room. Okay, so and then I think I might have met John Hamill, who is sort of Paul's right hand guy. Both of them are you know super tight with Paul and do sort of everything with him. Although John's sort of retired now, but um, and then and then I met Paul, and I think I even told him it's like it took a, took me about two or three days to kind of get used to being, you know, in the room with them because it's like someone you spend so so much of your life with as an archetype or a distant icon all of a sudden is your friend and your um, you know your colleague. <laughs> working on music so that's that's really a it's a huge jump you know but uh <clears throat> but yeah but the, you know the, actually the cool thing within about maybe 45 minutes or less we were jamming and playing music and then there's a certain and it's and it's kind of hard to explain even maybe other musicians can you know you guys can relate to it when you're playing with humans and you're playing music it's super interactive. You're, everyone's listening really closely. You yeah. know, you can't not unless you're just a bad musician, and and it's very spiritual. It's a bit, it's like a it's a language. It's communication. So it takes sort of takes the pressure off in a way. You just like you're doing your thing, just jamming and, and working on music, and and it it, it really sort of um, breaks that barrier somehow. You know, it makes right. it just real. In a, in a in a surreal way you know right it's a common bond everybody has right so that's that's fantastic um and which album was this that you were working on with paul at that point uh that was driving rain so we played on driving rain we played on memory almost full we played a little bit on uh what was the other one um, uh chaos and creation we played on new a lot on new and a lot on the new record, which is not new. It's called uh, uh, Egypt Station. It's a newer one. And I, I guess I kind of did the same thing. Probably every musician is. You know, I've been doing a lot of recording, and you know, I do. I have the, my domestic world, you know, you know. And then I'll go to the studio on certain nights when I'm not, you know, put my daughter to bed, and then, <laughs> you know, go start, you know, chipping away at recording some music. And it's a, uh, it's a really, uh, 
it's kind of great to have a routine because I think most musicians know routines are almost impossible. You know, like if you're, if you're all of a sudden working with this person, working with that person and this time, the schedule and this, you know, it's, it's not, it's not routine at all. And, right. uh, for better, for worse. I kind of like that, but I can't, you know, routines are kind of amazing, especially if you can get into a groove of doing something, accomplishing something you like, or, you know, achieving, you know, achieving something. But, um, Have you found that it's, uh, you've been able to be creative at, during this time, or has it been, some, I know some people have had kind of like writer's block and haven't been able to produce, you know, that kind of stuff. I, yeah, I mean, so I've had some of that, but I've, I've definitely had some breakthroughs and, and, and gotten some good music together. And it's really, I'm really excited about this new stuff. There's a lot of variety, like, like there's this one tune that I, uh, that um, I went to this, this uh, protest it was for, um, uh, I think it was drilling in the Pacific and there was these Native American cats that were like doing the, their sort of chanting singing bit and, and with the, <clears throat> and they were playing and they and they were playing their drums and stuff. I ended up turning that just I was listening to it going, oh, that's interesting. That's kind of cool. I videotaped it and then I just turned it into something. <laughs> and, uh, and then it became it had a life of its own, you know, and then I those guys are my friends through that, which is really cool. Um, and so there's been some collaborative stuff, you know, with other people, which is always fun. And then some stuff where I just end up, you know, finding a zone and just creating some some you know, you find a melody or a riff or something or some lyrics and you kind of just shape it into something. And then there's been some instrumental stuff, which I've done. Uh, so, yeah, it's all just fun. And now, oh, I also work with this other guy, Bunk Gardner, who plays in the original, he played in the original Mothers of Invention. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and he, he plays like, uh, you know, sax and flute and, and uh, bassoon and all these cool weird instruments, right? And so that's that was really fun. Sort of just kind of going out and doing this sort of. I don't know. I wouldn't even know how to describe it. It's sort of this its own version of jazzy kind of thing, you know, right? With guitars and and sort of weird effects and it and it's yeah, it's cool. I look forward to hearing it. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about getting it out there. You know, it's, it's, I realize you know, the whole thing about music too, it's like, um, whether you, you know, the money thing aside, because that's not even what I'm talking about, um, that just the, to communicate with other people, I think that's what, you know, they say that that's every, every person's like ultimate need is to communicate somehow, you know, and it's a, it's a great way to, you know, feather, fellow, fellow people that appreciate musical tones and notes and, and sounds and, and, you know, expression and lyrics and all that stuff and, and, and musicianship. It's a, it's a really cool way to like communicate with people on the planet. I agree. No, yeah. I mean, at, at this, at this point, right, you're making your, your records for you. You're making your, you would, how you're making a record. You're not looking at a record to be a commercial success. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, whatever you want to say department. musically. Yeah. If anything happens in that department, great. But it's not the, uh, it's not the, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't even know, you know, I, I think that's becoming harder and harder to achieve, especially like if you're doing straight up, if you're like a, you know, 20 year old supermodel doing straight up, um, you know, pop. dance, rap, what pop, whatever it is that's, you know, the flavor of the week, the day, the minute, the second, <laughs> you know, it's so, it's such a quickly moving target. It's like, you know, which I don't do. I, I just, I just try to make music I like that, that I'd want to hear. I'd want to hear someone else making it and, and then go, oh, that's cool. And, and then that's, to me, that's that bond. And the beauty of art is that you can have this ubiquitous pop phenomenon that makes a lot of money or, you know, gets billions of, you know, airplay hours, but, but really communicating with, with um, people that, that have, that can relate to your taste is the amazing thing. And everyone's got a slightly different taste, if not a radically different taste. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, whether it's in paintings or music and that's, you know, we, there was experimenting with, uh, you know, people putting together set lists for Paul McCartney shows. I remember, and every single person 
had a different set list. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's um, amazing. And you, I got to say, you know, I remember um, in recent years, I, I was in Detroit and I came and saw you there uh-huh. um, a couple of years ago or something. No, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And because uh, it was the opening of, or it was relatively the opening of the new arena that they had put in there. And um, that's a long show you guys do. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's like a three hour show, isn't it? Yeah. just a, it's, it's somewhere between 240 and a little over three, depending on if there's extra Christmas or what's going on. But it's um, amazing. Jesus. <laughs> I think Paul blames Bruce Springsteen for that. You know, <laughs> yeah. exactly how how he felt that was necessary, but yeah, it's got to be an exhausting show for everyone. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I think especially for Paul, but he's you know he's down for it. That's you know sort of his his call. So, yeah. um, and and the the other issue is that there's so many bloody songs. Yeah, you know, there's so many songs that that are hugely popular. That yeah. you know, where do you start? Where do you stop? You know, yeah, how do you yeah. how do you not do that song, you know, yeah. or how do you not do that hit that was, you know, like how do you? A lot of my favorite, a lot of my favorite songs we played, you know, uh, yeah. we played maybe for a year tour or maybe two years, and then I know, like I, I remember back in the day, I was like, hey, yeah, we should play Helter Skelter, Paul. He's like, mm, yeah, and then a year later, yeah, Paul, what about Helter Skelter, you know, and and finally we did it. And I think he was really nervous about it. And then he saw, cause we had uh, at the, we had like dancers, like this word Cirque du Soleil kind of vibe opening up for us back in the day. And I remember there at the, at the, uh, the rehearsals, we were rehearsing at the, at the O2 before it became a venue. And it was this gigantic, like as big as a city of asphalt with a big tent over it, the Cavalier right. tent. And that's mm-hmm. where we were saying. And I remember that the, the pre-show they started rocking out and dancing. They're all dancers anyway, but they all started like really grooving to it. And all of a sudden, Paul's like, "Oh, okay, that's gonna work." Mm-hmm. And so that stayed in the show pretty much ever since. But some of them, like uh, "Too Many People," she came in through the bathroom window. Um, what's another one? Uh, anyway, some of those uh, getting better. You know that we played for maybe a tour or two. And and they just they went over really well and they sounded amazing and it was really fun and and for some reason we you know never kind of played them again. But now how do you, how do you approach um, learning the songs? I mean, is it is it something that you you know you just learn it on your own and then you come, go in and then is Paul ever vocal about oh it's you should do it this way or you know, I'm just curious you know how, how that process working with Paul and doing old Beatles songs or old songs of of his. Um, yeah, well, I mean, mostly we just kind of go in and just start learning. Everyone sort of falls into a zone. And we do it. We try. It's like, you don't want to talk about it more than you have to because everybody has ears. Everybody had knows kind of, I mean, you might, it might take some discussion. Like, you know, Paul will say, yeah, I think, I think I want to, it starts with Paul going, oh, I'm going to play piano on this. If he wants to play piano and Brian's on bass. And then if he goes, uh, I want to play, you know, guitar on this, then Brian's on bass. If he goes, I want to play bass on this, then Brian's on guitar. And that changes a lot right there. And then we sort of figure out, you know, how many background parts there are and who's singing what. And, you know, Abe usually takes the high. Brian usually takes the low and I get stuck in the middle. So. <laughs> yeah, that was another amazing thing. It's like when you when you see the show too, you realize how much singing duties everyone has. You know, yeah. like Abe is an amazing amazing singer. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable drummer, one of the best in the world. Yeah, fantastic. And, I mean, it must be a pleasure. I know you guys have worked together forever. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, like every day, man, Abe is just. I mean, <laughs> when I saw the show, you know, I hadn't seen. I, I had seen you guys before too, a long time ago, and then I hadn't seen it for years. Uh-huh. So when I saw it again, I'm just like, "Oh yeah, he's got, he's good." <laughs> yeah, the cool thing about Abe is that is when he gets in that gooey pocket thing, where it's just like, "Oh yeah," you know what I mean? Where where it's, I don't know, it's, and he he has sort of different modes as a drummer, but that's sort of my favorite mode that he gets into, and it's really cool, and he sort of does it better than anyone else, I think. You know? Yeah. The, the gooey pocket thing, like, ooh. 
Yeah, and he and, yeah. and just when he's doing his fills and and uh, it's just it's really rubbery. Yeah, it, and it just all kind of flows and it just comes out of it beautifully, and it's just like this. And it, it looks like he's barely hitting things, but I know he's hitting it quite hard. It's mm. a weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's very strange. It's a weird thing. I, yeah, he's, I've known him for he's, he's kind of hyper uh, flexible, and I think that's one of the reasons. Like, he has to be careful not to over flex. Yeah, there's certain body types, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm the opposite. I'm constantly trying to stretch myself out. He's like, he can't stretch too much or it could cause problems. But uh, hmm. I think that's one of the reasons he has that, that I don't know. It, we all have our different, you know, talents and physicalities and stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, but I mean, the singing that everyone has to do is crazy. And it's it, it's cool because it's a real band doing it. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's, and it's not lost on us. It's really a, a treasure. It's a, a very... It's an honor to be able to do it, and and I think everyone appreciates it a lot and enough to go through, you know, all the years of because touring is not easy, even at the level of that is, you know, it's it's fun and it's great when you do the music. The rest of the time, it's you know, it's work and and you're traveling and your sleep gets interrupted and you're you know you're on a leash, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But even if you get to get off it for a little bit, but. Um, I mean, I remember the old days, you know, traveling around, like, say, with Edna Swap or something. You're in the van and in the snow and there's a whiteout. And you're, you know, I think we're coming to Minneapolis and it's just like a total whiteout, which you know, we weren't used to. It's like, I think Paul Bushnell was driving and, and it's just like trying to maintain that same distance from the brake lights in front of you or whatever. Yep. Yeah, you're just staring at the brake lights. <laughs> That's all you're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many crazy dramas and weird things that happen when you get, you know, a bunch of people trying to, you know, maintain a tour <laughs> in that, in that kind of tight space and you're doing clubs and, and, you know, theaters. And so it's, you know, <laughs> there's been, like I said, a lot of winding roads, man. Yeah. 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 I can imagine. Hey, we missed a super chat, Dave. Um, from Chris De La Cerda. Happy, have a great birthday, Mark. Thank you. Uh, he says, Dave, I'm learning to build, repair guitar amps. What books or resources would you recommend to understand this complex craft? And Rusty, any enlightening moments with Paul? You want to start, Dave? Yeah, you first, Rusty. No, no, you first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, books and things and stuff about guitar amps. Oh, boy. Um, there's stuff from uh, London Power. There's a bunch of books out that are quite good. There used to be an old Torres book, which I'm not sure is around anymore, but uh, that was kind of fun for learning some stuff. Anything from um, Merlin Belcourt or – uh, it's the, um, hmm, what's it called? I forgot. Um, anyway, there's this cat called Merlin and he has written these two band books, which is quite good for learning. And there's some other basic ones that were, have been around forever. Like I think Tim Mitchell had one that's been around forever. And, and, uh, you, you know, you can, you can find them out there. There's a lot of books on, like, if you go to amplifiedparts.com um they have a bunch of books because they're a parts supplier for guitar amps and stuff and uh and uh you know and hunt around on the internet and build a kit and you know just do do some stuff and you'll start learning you gotta get your hands dirty you gotta get shocked and thrown across the room a couple times mm -hmm. you need some 240 right well, at least they're not 240. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I've been told by a Europe, uh, European techs. Uh, we have one, a guy from Germany that works for us, and uh, he goes, "Yeah, this is this is nothing." <laughs> he goes, "Try 50 hertz, 240 volts, and try getting shocked there." <laughs> he goes, "It's a whole different world." Yeah, no, thank you. Right. I'm like, "Yeah, no, it's okay." You know. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll stay away. And uh, be careful, and don't shock yourself if you can avoid it. <clears throat> Question from Fusion Fifty Eight: What was it like working on Patty Smythe's record? Wait, wait. There was a second part of that first question, though, with Rusty. All right. Oh, yeah. Right, right. I forgot. Sorry. Oh, okay. So, um, okay. So, let's see. Paul, what was the question again about, about any Paul? enlightening moments with Paul? 
Oh, you know, so many. It, it, we've had like so so many great moments. It's like incredible. Uh, just uh, I remember doing we were working on um, on that song one after nine oh nine, which is sort of this song the Beatles did back when before they were signed, I think, and then um, and then they picked it up and let it be and did a version on that. And uh, and we're going over the lyrics, and it's like, and and the lyrics were because we had one guy that goes and searches to find the right lyrics, and he, and it's like, come on, baby, don't be uh, cold as ice was the line, the the lyric, and uh, and I thought, I go, oh, I thought it was, come on, baby, don't be so precise, and so and Paul was laughing at me, you know, because it, it's easy to like you hear like guys singing lyrics, especially if it's like Mick Jagger or something, you don't know what the hell he's singing. Right. And, uh, and so I remember we were singing it together and I was singing the higher part and Paul was singing the lower part and it does that double harmony thing. And then he looks at me, he's like, come on, baby, don't be so precise. And it was really, it was really like charming that he actually changed the lyric to what I thought it was just for fun. <laughs> it didn't stay that way, but. Right. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, I, I don't remember if it was you that told me this story, uh, speaking of things that have happened over the years and stuff um, about Paul and the, and the hole in the stage. Was yeah. You know, he what that was crazy because um, tell, tell that story. That's just an interesting story. Well, it's ridiculous. Hey, well, what happened was he always plays piano on the side on this riser. Right. And he's like, I really want to do a thing where I'm playing the piano at the front. You know, like I want to be in the middle. I don't want to always be on the side. They go, okay. So he goes, well, I guess in order to do that, you know, we have the, the grand piano on, we'll put it on a riser and it'll come up in the middle of the stage. So, so we did it in rehearsals and blah, 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 practice and it, it worked really well. And then it kind of went, Meow, and then all of a sudden it was like Vegas, you know, it just disappeared. And then it would go and come up and, and, and it would start. So it was about the second or third show of the tour. I think it was 2004, I believe. And, uh, and he, I remember he was actually, he was holding his face and he was just about to introduce me. And, uh, and he takes a step or two backwards and the hole was right there. The hole had opened up in the stage and he'd like forgotten about the hole. And the piano was down way at the bottom and he just fell. He was just holding his face and he just like went, it was like slow motion, just oh, and he just I looked down, and it was way down there. And he landed on his back on top of the piano, and his, his bass just went blah, blah, and flew across to the side of the, you know, the piano or something down in the hole. <laughs> and I'm looking down, I'm like, did he just die? Is he I mean what happened? And and I mean, I, I knew it really. Are we done? <laughs> and I thought just, and so he just kind of composes himself and gets up and, and the thing goes, he goes, okay, next song. Then And he went into it. And as if nothing had ever happened. And it was the most ridiculous, crazy moment. <laughs> wow. Next day he wasn't even sore. At least he said he wasn't. I don't know, man. I was like, how, like I'd be, I mean, I think the good thing was that he it was it was he was so out of control that he just relaxed and fell and and if you would have tensed up it probably would have been really bad, you know. Yeah, I remember you were saying he goes, I I basically didn't know if that was it, done, <laughs> yeah. all finished, my my time with him is done. <laughs> or <laughs> was that filmed? Is that like on YouTube? You can see it. Uh, Rusty froze there for well, a Well, cap capturing moment on something. The video, that was like my favorite set list we ever did. It was called uh, A Space Within Us or Between Us. Or within Us, I guess. Are you guys there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you okay, froze good. up there for a moment. I heard, I, heard, I heard the last part of it. Yeah. <laughs> but that was nuts. I remember the first tour we did, there was another thing that was kind of wacky like that, a very Spinal Tap moment where we were playing and we had a curtain coming up. It was like, we'd start, we, I think we started with Hello Goodbye and then the curtain would come up slowly 
And one of the shows, one of the early shows, the mic clip somehow caught on the curtain and the microphone, the stand, the mic, the whole thing, Paul's mic, went up. <laughs> Did you catch that? Yeah. It, yeah. It's, I mean, uh, are we cutting it out? Mine was sort of cutting it out. Anyway, so it, it went up with the curtain. And so then a roadie came, jumped out on stage and he was like, you know, trying to get the microphone down because the curtain kept going up and, and the curtain guy didn't notice that it was happening. And he eventually did get it down. <laughs> it was such a moment, really funny. I guess I'm not singing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just we'll go around and around a few times here, guys. <laughs> but it's well, great. Thing. You're live, you know, you're playing a live show. I mean, anything can happen, you know. Yeah, yeah. Crazy yeah. mistakes or whatever. It, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's you, you try to have a perfect show and it's never 100% perfect. And, um, but I guess that's the beauty of it at the end of the day. Well, that's what makes a live show exciting. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, so what gear do you use? What, what amps? I think you're a Morgan guy, right? You use Morgan amps or. Yeah. The last couple of tours been using Morgan. I was using divided by 13, um, for years and years. And, uh, when I'm in the studio, you know, I'll use uh, divided by Morgan's and old vintage amps and, um, you know, depending, cause I have a few different setups, you know, one with like a 112 cabinet that's, a uh, this great 112 cabinet that uh, divided by 13 makes, it's called the Rock Block. And it's been, uh, speaking of, of uh, Bob Rock, I guess him and, and Fred designed it together. And it's just really simple 112, but it sounds really good. It's like got a lot of, um, a lot of low end. It just has the, an evenness. Because the cool thing about 112 cabinets is that they don't have any phasing issues. Yeah. You know, it's just one speaker and it's a more simple sound source. So if you can get them to sound big enough, then it's it's pretty cool. And then I'll have I have a two twelve thing with a, like an AC thirty and a um, old the sixties AC thirty and a two twelve, and uh, and I guess I have a four twelve divided by, and then I'll some of them plug the Morgan head into the the one twelve. You know, what I mean, it's like I, I kind of mix it up, and uh, and uh, you know, like I say, use the divided bys a lot. I I also have uh, some Laney heads that I like. Um, that uh, um, for certain things, and then uh, and speaking of which, Dave has an amazing amp, the uh, the Freeman's. Now, was the Dirty Shirley? Is that the one that? You yeah, used? that's the one you liked. I, I there was a. I remember trying. They're all great. They all kind of got the the thumpy thing. The the weird thing about your amps is that it almost sounds like. It makes you feel like you're playing the guitar. The guitar plays itself a little bit. Yeah, it's hard to put it into words, but it's. Uh, yeah. And then the, you have another one that's. Um, uh, I remember it was a bit loud for me, but it was sounded really good. Oh, like, was it uh, uh, the cleaner amp, the Buxom Betty? Yeah. yeah. What was it called? Buxom Betty. It's a. It's a. It yeah, was a loud. Bad. Clean reverbed uh, Fender meets Marshall-y thing. Do you have what? Do you have an EL eighty four amp or no? Yeah, we have several several smaller amps. Well, like a bigger EL eighty four amp. Well, bigger like thirty watts. Watt? Like 30 watt? It must have been the Fendery one that I liked then. Yeah, that, it was hey, I wasn't sure if it was a Fendery one or a box based one, but no, it was the Fendery one. Oh, okay, yeah, that one. That one sounds great. It's loud. But, it's loud, yeah. yeah. But a lot of times, like really loud amps sound amazing if you can if you can contain them in the studio. It's really more yeah. of a studio thing because I found that like my my stage level is reduced quite a bit because I don't I don't want any more volume than I have to have. And I play with two amps live. You know, it's like some things are stereo, and uh, it's sort of dual mono until stereo moment. Yeah, but, well, you're, he's got a rack full of stuff that he's had for years, a couple racks. How many racks have we done, Dave? How many pedal boards and racks? I don't even know how many. Well, you, you, I don't I don't know either, but, you know, the funny thing is it's is it's, um, it, it's like the rack morphed a little bit. It wasn't necessarily like a whole new one. It, it was like 
you had, I remember for years you had this small green rack and, and, and then the stuff from that went in a bigger rack and kind of morphed a little bit more in that, uh, but it, it's still some of the same stuff that you've always used. Your right. Phone, yeah. I pedal. Each, and, and, each and, rack would go through a, a metamorphosis and then I go, okay, just got to dump it, start over. And then we do that and we, that would change. And then, yeah, yeah exactly. That's amazing. Cause, uh, but you know, like I, I, I've told Dave this before, but it, but it's just the sound, the sound of his, uh, his pedal boards is uniquely more transparent than any other people have ever used. Hmm. So it's it's pretty, and and that's sort of a trick, you know. It's a, it's a, I guess it's all, it's combined of many, many tricks and so much experience that that Dave has over the years, and being well, you know, himself too. You have to have years, you know, of being able to listen to things and have good ears for it. You know, it's like when we were tweaking the other day, I kind of knew right away what you were talking about. And I changed it and did it before you even played through it that day. Yeah, right. It's like, <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's like perfect. oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a process. So uh, what? there was another question, Mark. Uh, what was it like playing with Patty Smythe? Oh, Patty Smythe. Yeah, she's uh, she's actually my neighbor. Um, yeah, it was great. We it was a fun band, and um, and uh, you know we did. did it, you know, the main bit of it was the studio. I think I might have done a few jobs with her. I did it, maybe even a Howard Stern thing with her, but uh, hmm. uh, it was mostly the the studio thing, and that was that was fun. I remember Roy Bitten from uh, Springsteen's band was producing. And uh, it's Kenny Aronoff and John Pierce and Tim Pierce and um, so yeah, it was just it was it was just a great vibe. You know, everyone had fun and and uh, you know, it was it was one of those rare sort of easygoing kind of sessions where it all just kind of fell into place nicely. You know, right. and it was, but it was cool for me because all the all the all the musicians I was playing with at the time were very experienced. And probably had a little more experience than I did. I mean, I had a fair amount, but still, they were very seasoned. And so, I, I guess I, I kind of felt like I learned a bit in that one. I mean, you know, I always try to learn. You know, it's like I, I think it's humbling when you go into a studio and you try to get a good guitar sound. Sometimes you throw it up and it sounds amazing. Sometimes you, you have to mess with it a lot. And then the heartbreaker is when you, you throw it up and the engineer just throws a mic on it and it doesn't sound good. And then all of a sudden they've done the take and you you'll get a chance to go redo it. You know, that's right. always the, problem. so, but you, you know, you live and learn, I suppose. Is there a go-to amp that you would do that you use for session work and stuff like that? Or, you know, or you would just show up and use what they had or. Um, no, no. I, I mean, I've always carried my gear around, you know, it's been morphing a lot, you know, to buy to buy is mostly, uh, and it's Morgan's now I used to, and, um, and so the, the same ones you mentioned. A few amps. I kind of like to have, if possible, I'll, I'll do a few amps and kind of, you know, either use them like dual mono or, um, sort of see which one is, is translating that day because it's kind of voodoo. I mean, I was talking about this with Dave yesterday too, like how, how you can have your whole setup and you get everything sounding amazing. You go, all right, days, uh, guys, we'll, we'll knock it off. We'll come back tomorrow. And then you come back and then you, you go into play and everything sounds different and nothing has changed. But, you know, you've got Just a day. or whatever the hell it is, electricity that day, whatever it is, something's different. Or maybe it's a bunch of things. Maybe it's the butterfly flapping his wings across in China or something. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we have a question from uh, Paul Crane. He says, what valves for Laney LC-15R, one greenback, one gold? Um, what, Sadie, what are you talking about Laney what? I don't even know what the LC-15R is. Oh, I see it. Um, well, I only use old Laney's, like late 60s, early 70s. Gotcha. Which are super group, and then there's pre-super groups. So anything of like the Laney's that they make now, I've never even heard. I don't know anything about them. Yeah. Gotcha. Any, any opinion on this, Dave? I, I, like I said, I don't, I'm not, I don't even know what tubes are in that 
thing. Uh, so I'd have to look it up and then I can make some recommendations, but gotcha. I'd have to look it up. Uh, he can, he can email me and I'll be happy to look it up for him. Yeah. Email Dave. Um, and there's another question down here from Carl G. Uh, Rusty, do you play your Gibson signature 335 on stage or the original? Um, and, and are they stock the original? And then for a while, I was always playing the signature for a number of years. And then I kind of went back to my um, original. You know, there's sort of pros and cons of each one. I, I like, um, I think in a way, the, uh, the newer one sounds a little fatter maybe. But I think there's something about like vintage guitars where the high end is, is different. I don't know. It's just they're you know they're different beasts, but right. uh, you know they're 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 great. They're they're awesome instruments. So you can't go wrong with either one really. Yeah, they they are. Are. great guitars. Here, let, um, I'm going to see if I can uh, share it now. I think I think I changed my um, my settings. So let's see. I think it'll work. No, it's still not working. Oh, there we go. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Oh, work, yes. Save 11%. <laughs> so here's the guitar, guys. Looks great. Yeah. Is that yeah. an exact, exact replica of the one that you have? Um. Yeah, in theory. I mean, there's no way you can possibly do an exact, exact replica. I mean, part of it too is that the way that the guitar is worn like this doesn't have any aging you know if you want to get the guitar aged you have to take to someone to age it but right. my original one has a lot of wear underneath the arm where i guess you know from years of people playing it in a club or whatever you sweat on it and and it sort of it starts to wear away the wood um in different places and, and all that which i love that's great but I think um, you know, the, the Gibsons, they, they use nitro and all that stuff. They use the right paint. Because that, that's a real bummer if someone uses poly and then it's like plastic city. Yeah, I, I hate that. I really do. Um, let's see. I want to be respectful of your time, Rusty. I know you, you yeah, say yeah. about an hour, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, why don't we take this last question for you. Um, what was your favorite gig with Paul? My favorite gig, I guess one, there's so many favorite gigs, really. But for some reason, the one that comes to mind is when we played in Rome, we did the show in front of the Colosseum. And there's a road, the Appian Way, which is, you know, famous. In fact, I saw the movie Spartacus recently. Uh, it was a Stanley Kubrick film with uh, Kirk Douglas and stuff. But, uh, uh, and they had the Epping Way and like he's getting strung up there on the cruise. Of, you know, it's like, uh, it, it's just the whole, <laughs> the, the whole, uh, you know, Romans. I mean, this is where the, the Colosseum where they, they threw the, the Christians to the lions. I mean, there's so much history here, you know? And so right. anyway, we're playing in front of that and down the street, we'd have like a normal big stage and PA and lights and, and big screens and stuff. And then it'd be like 50,000 people. And then they'd have another set of PA and screens and then 50,000 people, another set. And this went on, there's like 500,000 people or something there. Wow. And, and this went all the way down this road. And it looked like once, cause we started, I remember and it was sort of like dusk, you know, where it's kind of daylighty and the lights barely work. And then we kept playing and then the lights, then it turned a little dark. And then I remember we were doing a song and everyone held up their lighters at the same time. And it looked like this firefly river. It went off the edge of the earth. Hmm. It was so amazing. And it was just a cool gig because I think that that was the first gig we played with that many people at it. And that's so, that was a huge buzz. And it, it's a different experience. And you can't even quantify it because like in a way, what's the difference if you play for one person, it's almost like one person's the hardest audience to have, really. Right, right. You know, or if you pay, play for a hundred or a thousand or whatever, but there was just some weird energy that was that was really tremendous at that show. That's great. 
That's awesome. Um, last, we have Tony Martinez who gave us a super chat. Thank you, Tony. Really appreciate it. But he has a uh, question involved with that too. There is? It's above. Uh, Tony, uh, he asked, I got a 71 Marshall empty cabinet. Oh, I see. What should I put in there to match speaker wise? A reissue greenbacks will work. They'll be a good choice. Um, unless you can somehow get old speakers, <laughs> but that's a crap shoot sometimes. Um, uh, so the standard greenback reissue, they're made in England again and they sound good. You don't need the heritage and wear them in a little bit and you'll be golden. Yeah. Wearing them in. That's the thing. It takes a little time, right? It takes a little time, but I mean, they sound pretty good out of the box and just, they just need to be beat up a little bit. Um, and the last thing is Dave for that super chat question. Uh, the Laney fifth. LC 15 R has got two EL 84s and three 12 AX. Well, I mean, <clears throat> EL 84s. Well, I mean, your choices really that are available either a Sovtech brand EL 84 or a JJ EL 84. JJs will be less compressed than the Sovtech ones. It depends on what you want to get out of the amp. Um, and for as far as preamp tubes, uh, I mean, this these days there's a lot of choices and they all sound a little different uh chinese preamp tubes that were my favorite are gone so then you're stuck with a, a variety of sovtech varieties or jj's um depends on the amp hard to say for sure what you're going to like in it there there is a new tube uh, uh from eh called the 7025 eh 7025 that's actually brand new that sounds really good. It's a little lower gain than 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 some tubes, but the tone is is nice. It's a little more European sounding. It sounds pretty good. So uh, so that's that's a good option. Okay, awesome. Well, Rusty, I want to thank you for your time. I really do. Um, yeah, great talking to you guys. Yeah, same here. Same here. Big fan of your of yours. And uh, where can people uh, look out for your music and and you know, see your stuff. You have a website or anything like that? Yeah, well, my website's just rustyanderson.com. And you see, you can buy, uh, you know, if you want CDs, you can get it there, certainly. And then um, uh, Spotify, you know, all the normal streaming places. And, and uh, like I said, I think that in the next few weeks or so, things are going to start appearing that aren't there now. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the best way to do it. Cool. Fantastic. Awesome. And our next guest is uh, Steve Lukather on October 2nd, part two. And uh, everybody have a great weekend. I know I'm going to have a great weekend. I'm, gonna, I'm off to go have a beer uh, that my wife just got for me. She's Excellent. Got <laughs> so, uh, Rusty, thanks again. Really appreciate it. And uh, just hang on while I hang up. Everybody have a great weekend. Enjoy. Enjoy your